Now we start a new section in this tutorial. This section is about programming TCP clients and servers. In this section, we will learn how the TCP protocol works. Then we will create a simple TCP echo server. Then we will modify the server to be multi-thread. We will talk about network scalability and finally, how to handle network connections using thread pools. This video is about the details of the TCP protocol. This topic is complex and in case you do not understand something from it, please do not be afraid. The information we discuss here is mainly needed to understand what happens when something is not working. You may also skip this video and return to it later or view it again some later time. Most of the details that we discuss here are hidden by the programming interface that we use in our application. TCP provides a connection-oriented, reliable byte stream service. It means that the applications at the two ends of the TCP channel can send bytes one after the other into the TCP channel and can receive the bytes on the other side without worrying about packets, timing, packet orders that we had to deal with using UDP. The term connection-oriented means the two applications using TCP must establish a TCP connection with each other before they can exchange data. It's a full duplex protocol, meaning that each TCP connection supports a pair of byte streams, one flowing in one direction, the other one flowing in the other direction. From the application's viewpoint, TCP transfers a continuous stream of bytes. TCP does this by grouping the bytes in TCP segments, which are passed to IP for transmission to the destination. TCP itself decides how to segment the data and it may forward the data at its own convenience. TCP assigns a sequence number to each segment transmitted and expects a positive acknowledgement from the receiving TCP. If the acknowledgement is not received within a timeout interval, the data is retransmitted. The receiving TCP uses the sequence numbers to rearrange the segments when they arrive out of order and to eliminate duplicate segments. These sequence numbers grow along with the number of bytes sent. If one side of the communication sends 100 bytes in a segment to the other side, then the next sequence number will be 100 larger. The starting value of the sequence numbers, however, is not zero. For security reasons, it starts from a random value and grows from there by the bytes. We should also know that the sequence numbers are sent on 32 bits, and although 2 to the power of 32 is a really huge number, TCP communications can transfer more than that many bytes. If that happens, the sequence number simply rolls over and starts from zero. To allow for many processes within a single host to use TCP communication simultaneously, TCP provides a set of ports within each host. The address and the port together is a socket. A pair of sockets uniquely identifies each connection. TCP provides for concurrent data streams in both directions. TCP connections are created between a client and the server. The server starts to listen to incoming connections and the client connects to the server. To connect to the server, the client sends a SYN segment. When the server receives this segment, it replies with a so-called SYN plus ACK segment. When this arrives to the client, it replies with an ACK segment. After this has arrived, the connection is established. This three-way communication ensures that the connection is treated as established on both sides only if both sides have the information that the network can transport the segments in both ways. When the SYN arrives to the server, the server knows that the communication works from the client to the server, 
but the client has no information at this point. When the SYN plus ACK segment arrives to the client, the client knows that the network works in both directions, but the server still only knows for sure that the data segments can travel from the client to the server. It does not know yet that the packet it sent has reached the client. Finally, when the final ACK segment arrives at the server, both the client and the server have the information that the network is connected and is properly routed so that they can communicate. This is called a three-way handshake. To understand how this process works, we can look at the TCP connection state diagram. First, the connection is closed, or in other words, not opened. This is true for both sides. Then the server starts to listen on the port and gets into the listen state. After this, when the client wants to connect to the server, it sends a SYN package, as we have seen already on the previous diagram. When it sends the SYN package, the state of the client becomes SYN sent. When the SYN package arrives, the server gets from the listen state to SYN received state. Then the server sends ACK plus SYN segment and when it arrives, the state of the client goes to established. On the client side, the connection is established, but to be sure that the server also thinks it that way, the client sends an ACK package to the server. When it arrives, the state of the server also becomes established. Closing the connection is similar to this protocol, but from the programmer point of view, that is not so important. Knowing what happens when we open a TCP connection, sometimes good knowledge, when the connection is not working properly. We have to debug our code on low level or solve some performance issues. TCP uses a sliding window to control the number of segments sent to the channel. This is to prevent overloading a channel with more data than it can accept. As all segments are acknowledged, the sending side will know which segments have arrived. When packets arrive in different order, the acknowledged number sent back is the largest number up to which all segments has arrived. If there is a segment containing first 100 bytes of the communication, then a segment containing another 100 bytes, but the sequence number is 200 instead of 100, it essentially means that this is the third segment and there should be one or more packages on the network traveling that contain the second hundred bytes of the transfer. In such situation, the acknowledgement sends back the sequence number 100 and not 300 because although we received 200 bytes, the latest byte index that ends a continuous segment in the transfer is 100. This way each side knows which is the last byte that has arrived to the other side. If an application has lots of data to send to the channel and the bytes are written to the TCP stack, then the TCP stack itself has to store the bytes that were not acknowledged. The bytes that were acknowledged surely arrive to the other side, but the bytes that are not sent yet should be sent and those who were sent but not acknowledged yet may need to be resent. On the receiving side, bytes have to be buffered. Those that have arrived and are available but the application program has not read yet from the TCP stack, as well as those that have arrived but cannot be served to the application because some earlier bytes with lower sequence numbers have not arrived yet. In the buffer of the receiving side is full, then it cannot do anything better but throwing an extra data away, not acknowledging it as arrived. The sliding window has a size that is the number of the bytes that the TCP application is willing to send to the other side following the last acknowledgement byte. This window slides forward in time as newer and newer acknowledgements arrive. If we look at the actual speed of CPUs and the time for network traffic, it is easy to understand why this is needed. The typical 
CPU clock cycle is one nanosecond. This is the heartbeat of the computer. This is the time that is needed for the CPU to perform one simple task. For a human, this is something like one second. Treating one nanosecond as a heartbeat, we can say that 60 nanosecond, which is approximately time to access memory, is a CPU minute. This is something like saying that one year is seven dog years because dogs live seven times less than man. To send a TCP segment through the Atlantic, it takes a few hundred milliseconds. That is approximately six CPU years. When we download a web page and read it for two minutes, the next TCP session opened by the browser when we click on a link is almost 4000 CPU years. For the CPU, this communication is slower than 19th century sail ships through the Atlantic. This is not because the network is slow. The network speed is limited almost only by the speed of light. But CPUs are extremely fast. To avoid the congestion of the channel, the sending of segments starts slow. After the TCP channel was established, the client sends only one segment and starts to wait for acknowledgement. After it increases the number of segments to two, it sends in fast succession. For each acknowledgement, it receives the number of packages it sends without acknowledgement is increased. This will speed the transfer up to the possible bandwidth, exponential growth. When the bandwidth is reached at the bottleneck of the network, some of the routers will drop segments as it cannot forward them because of the bandwidth limit. This will tell the sender not to increase the speed anymore. This is important to understand when we create HTTP applications. But for now, the important thing is to remember that TCP connections start to send data slowly and they speed up only later. And if ever we need to close a TCP connection and open a new one, then it will first be slow and speed up only in a few hundred milliseconds.